Okay, can you hear me? Oh, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Just doing a little tech check. Okay, perfect. I think there might be just a tiny little delay with the chat box. Yay, everybody's here. Okay. So this is awesome. Um, we are being recorded, just so you know, um, obviously, because we're going to be able to hopefully share the replay with those friends who couldn't make it to join us tonight. So hopefully you have your tea or water or something with you to drink. Um, hopefully you have, and I'm giggling because mine's right next to me, hopefully you have your <laughs> mobile device uh, put away with the volume turned off so that you can uh, have just complete presence. Um, hopefully your kids are tucked into bed, you're cozy and comfy, and um, we're gonna get started. I'm sure that we have a few people that are gonna be popping on who aren't on here just yet, so uh, if those, oh, some people are saying they cannot hear me. Is that true? Just doing another little sound check. If you can hear me, can you just let me know in the chat box? Hello? Is anybody hearing me? I don't think so. Hmm. Okay. All right. There are some people that still can. So if you can't hear me, um, I'm not really sure. Let's see. Nikhil is here. He's my assistant director of yoga for classrooms, and he is 100% responsible for pulling this together to make it possible. So he might type in the chat box with a suggestion um, as to how you could make sure and do all the little things that you might be able to do to, to try to hear me. Okay. But we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, it looks like the PowerPoint is up and we're ready to go. So hopefully you're in the right place. This is a live Q&A with me. Um, it says you've attended the workshop, so now what? But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have attended the workshop, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, hopefully everybody's still popping on. Thank you for introducing yourself. It looks like we have people from literally everywhere around the country and all kinds of different kinds of folks with different occupations. And we'll get to that also in a few minutes. So I just want to set a couple of expectations before we dive in here. Uh, first of all, I want to say what this webinar is not, just to make sure where <laughs> everybody knows what they're here for. Um, this webinar is not how to teach yoga in the classroom or even really the benefits of doing so. So the expectation here is that you know the answers to that already. Um, and if you don't, I highly recommend that you visit our website, of, of course. Um, check out our blog, our Facebook page, take a look into some of the articles that we have. Um, we also have a one-day workshop. Again, I just mentioned that, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, so if you haven't taken it or maybe you want to check out we have a free one hour introduction on our youtube page i'll talk about that more later so you could check that out as well but um it doesn't mean you're in the wrong place uh, just because you haven't taken the workshop so um what to expect you're going to learn a little bit about me and what led me to developing y for c um i'm going to find out about where you are now so I'm gonna ask you some questions and I wanna know a little bit about your successes and challenges and I will be giving some live feedback in answer to that. Um, from my own experience, I'm also gonna share a few keys to successful school-wide implementation of yoga and mindfulness. So I'm guessing that you're here because that might be something that you're really interested in. Um, that was a little bit advertised on the Facebook Live video and then the other video that uh, you saw when you registered. Um, so that is mostly what I'm gonna be focusing on uh, as keys and tools for that. I'm also gonna share with you then ways that you, starting tomorrow, can start to take a leadership role at your school with the intention of gaining buy-in and support and even leading implementation at your school if that's not something that you're doing already. So hopefully that will be really helpful and inspiring for you. And um, 
in addition and related to that, I'll be giving you some tips and some resources and best of all, some special bonus offers that will support you with that endeavor. So if that sounds good to you, give me a yes in the chat box, just so I know that you want to know that. Okay. Awesome. All right, so before I tell you a little bit about me, I would like to get to know you a little. So I think Nikhil's gonna be behind the scenes here, putting up a poll, and the poll is going to ask what you are. So what do you do for a living and, and kind of what your role is? So maybe you're a classroom teacher, maybe you're a school counselor. I know I've seen a couple of those already. Um, you might also be, you might also be uh, a program provider. So I think the keel's putting up the poll. I'm having a little bit of a delay seeing that, but perhaps you are seeing that. So maybe it's possible that I can't see it. Um, oh, here it is. I can see it. This is so exciting. All right. So wow, we so far have quite a few. Oh, it's changing. So you're still choosing who you are. We've got a few others too. And um, when we go back to the chat box, we can take a look and you can help, you can put that in. So this is interesting. So we have really um, kind of an even mix of folks here. We've got about 20, 25% classroom teachers, 11, 12% school counselors. We've got several school, school social workers, 20% occupational therapists, about 10% physical therapists, um, speech therapists, we get a few of those, and uh, quite a few yoga and mindfulness service providers. So this is a great mix. Okay, so we're on to the next poll. Uh, do you have your own yoga and or mindfulness practice? This is your own. Do you have your very own personal mindfulness and or yoga practice. I'm just looking here. I think it might be loading. Here we go. So it's a yes or no answer. I'm just going to give it a couple of seconds here. Oh, this is so interesting. It was 100% for a minute, but now maybe people are thinking they want to be honest. <laughs> All right. So we've got about 75% of you on the call have a pretty solid personal yoga, meditation, or mindfulness practice, or a combination of those things. I mean, they're all really very interrelated. Um, and then 25% of you actually don't. So that's really interesting. Um, we might come back around to that later on. That's kind of why I'm asking these questions. Um, the final poll is asking, do you currently use yoga and mindfulness tools with your students. So, you know, this applies too. If you're a program provider, you're obviously doing that. <laughs> if you're a yoga mindfulness program provider. Um, but for those of you who um, are in schools, I'm curious to know that too. So let's take a look here. Yeah, so a lot of you are doing this work already in some way, shape, or form. Um, it might be a little bit, it might be a lot. But it looks like, you know, 85, ooh, it's going up, 86, 87, 87 percent of you are sharing yoga and mindfulness with your students in some way, shape, or form right now. So that's really awesome to know. Thank you for that. So we're going to go back to the chat now. And um, I do want to ask, for those of you who put other, that your, your role is other, um, go ahead and tell me what that is. I'd be really curious to know. Um, who else is on here? Yeah, school support staff, personal trainer, fitness instructor, retired school psychologist. Oh, I forgot to put psychologist. Um, I usually ask that. Yep, yoga and mindfulness instructor. Fantastic. All right. And uh, thank you for being honest about, about whether you have a personal practice or not. Um, I have to remind myself to have mine as well. Okay, so I'm going to start by introducing myself. Um, whoops, let me just get back to my PowerPoint here. So a little bit about me, um, yada, 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 right? This is just all of my, some things that I've worked on and created over the years. Obviously, I'm the founder and CEO of Childlight Yoga and Yoga for Classrooms. Um, I'm also the owner 
of a studio and training center, which I'm sitting in right now in my office um, in Dover, New Hampshire, which is about an hour north of Boston, really close to the coast where Massachusetts, Maine, and New Hampshire all meet up on the border. It's an absolutely fantastic area. Um, I'm also the author of the Yoga for Classrooms activity card deck, of course, and also Yoga for Children, 200 plus yoga poses, breathing exercises, and meditations for healthier, happier, more resilient children. How many of you have one or both of those titles? I'm thinking that you probably do. Yes. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'm also was really fortunate enough to be involved in a group who put together the best practices for yoga in schools book. Fabulous, fabulous resource. If you don't have that already, um, it's like $12. It's really inexpensive and it's really, really helpful. Um, so as a contributor to that book, um, take a look at that. You can obviously find it on Amazon. Um, looks like lots of people, lots of people say I have the cards. Oh, and Diane, wife and mom. Yes, parents. I did not put parents as an option. That is obviously really important too. And a lot of us are both, right? We're parents and uh, classroom teachers and so forth. So thank you. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, I should have specifically invited parents probably even more than I did. Um, I'm so I'm also the contributor and sponsor and creator of the research repository on yoga for children, adolescents, and schools. If you don't know this already, that is a free download that you can find on our research page. If you go to the website, yogaforclassrooms.com, um, it's an amazing resource. I actually did my very first Facebook Live invitation for everybody to download that about a week ago. Um, and uh, it, it is just an amazing and much needed resource. So if you are looking to get buy-in or you need to have evidence to show that yoga, mindfulness, and meditation is really beneficial for kids, adolescents, and in schools, that is what you need to print out. And not only are, is all the research there, but it is categorized, all 450 studies. And there are links to the abstracts and uh, the full manuscripts, even, when those are available. So that's a huge, amazing resource, hopefully, for everybody, whether you're a parent, school person, program provider, it doesn't matter. Um, I also contributed to uh, a study that was published looking at um, an intervention, the Yoga for Classrooms intervention, actually, at in some elementary school classrooms, and that was published in the Journal of Complementary and Alternative Medicine about a year and a half ago. Um, I'm a presenter, leader, and collaborator in the children's and school yoga movements. I'm actually super excited to be heading next week to the National Kids Yoga Conference in Washington, D.C. I've got a couple of presentations there, and I'm honored even to be on a panel, uh, a keynote panel, focusing on um, sustainability of, of yoga programs and school yoga programs and I'm involved in some other things as well and I'll be there with almost my whole team. I've got a bunch of us are going from childlike yoga, from yoga for classrooms. Um, who is going? Who else is going? Is anybody here going to the National Kids Yoga Conference that I might be able to run into? Uh, if you are, let me know in the chat box and I take notes. Um, and then finally, I'm a wife and a mom to two teens. So if that doesn't make me an expert on something, then I don't know what does. <laughs> For those of you who have teens, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to share a little bit of my story with you because I think it really serves to delineate the why behind the work that I do. Um, and it's a personal story, so it's not something that I actually share publicly very often. Um, but I'm going to do that now because I think it really matters and it speaks to uh, the importance of this work, which is, which is really the point. So this is my story. This is me in the green shirt. I, I don't even know. I think I was in kindergarten or first grade. It seems to me first grade, but I look a little young there for first. But I actually remember this picture being taken. And I don't know if you can see it in my eyes. I can see it in my eyes when I look at this picture. I was very scared and I was really nervous, um, full of anxiety. 
I knew when that picture was taken that that weekend, and I think that was taken on a Friday, that weekend I was going to a place where I knew I was not going to be safe. So I won't go into details, but you can probably imagine, you know, whatever that might have looked like or what that was. Um, I was a happy-go-lucky, pretty talkative, outgoing little girl, and then things started to happen to me that were out of my control. And I unfortunately, um, you know, experienced trauma from that. This is this is what happens. And I turned from a from a happy-go-lucky, outgoing little girl to quite an introverted uh, little girl to the point where my teachers would would tell my mom at the time that I was a very shy, and she was like, "You you can't possibly talk to be talking about my daughter, you know that's not the daughter that I know." Um, so in this picture, I am literally in. I remember when it was taken. I remember this very moment. I was in the fight, flight, or freeze mode, um, shut down. I was in self-protective mode, um, and I think this was about the time in my life where where there was a little bit of a separation, right, of of my mind and my body, a um, little bit of self self loathing. I think started at this point. Um, one coping skill that I developed as I went through the years here, and, and, and you know that that suffering and what was happening to me didn't go on forever. It did end at some point, but um, you know, as you know. When children have traumas, um, they don't leave. You know, it's when it's over, it's not over. It's still in the body. So I went about, you know, growing up, and uh, one of the coping skills that I developed was to I learned to maintain control and order. Right, it gave me a very misguided false sense of security. Um, so I wanted, I was the good girl, um, very good student always said and did the right thing, people pleaser. And I also was a perfectionist. So this translated beautifully right at school because perfectionism means I was super studious and involved in all the extracurriculars and doing everything right. Um, it was really important to me to be liked and accepted by everyone, peers and adults. And I, I think some of that had to do with the fact that I maybe I didn't like myself that much. But Somewhere along the way, this trickled over into strange eating patterns and what started off occasionally, you know, skipping meals and things in high school really spiraled out of control when I went off to college to a strange place. Um, it was a bit in culture shock. I went from a small town in Maine to Miami, Florida, if you could believe it. And suddenly life wasn't quite so simple or controllable. And I didn't have the skills for resilience. I wasn't taught them. And the less control I found I had with things like academics, relationships, um, and so on, the more I resented myself. I felt weak, um, self-loathing, and the more that that happens, the less that I ate because I wasn't deserving of nourishment. So things went downhill pretty quickly. And as you can see in this middle picture, I became severely anorexic to the point my own family members didn't recognize me when I got off the plane at the end of the semester. So this, uh, you know, it kind of tied in with depression as well. And within a year, I was admitted to an inpatient treatment facility, and which was a really good thing. And it was actually in the hospital where I was that I was introduced to yoga as part of recreational therapy that I was receiving. Um, and then you can see here in the third picture, that is actually me now. Um, it seems like some people are saying that there, there might be a little blurry, but I think some people are coming back. So I apologize for those of you who are having technology issues, but it looks like it's coming back now. So this is me with my family. Um, many, many things have happened, right, between the one picture and the other, but the biggest thing that happened was yoga. So yoga and meditation came into my life, and also I had children. And I knew immediately uh, from the time I had children that I wanted them to have the tools for emotional resilience that I didn't have. And my mission and my drive really came from that place. So here's the thing, yoga doesn't make everything easy and peaceful, right? Life is life, it's ever-changing and unpredictable. But what I continue to learn and teach is awareness and the power of awareness so that 
super powerful skill of noticing what's happening within and around us and then having the ability to reach into my toolbox and mindfully choose a tool for self-regulation. That then offers me and our kids, right, the pause that we need to respond to whatever's happening mindfully, non-reactively, and with intentionality and, and I, I almost feel like this is the most important part, and with self-compassion. So my intention with all of this is to make yoga and mindfulness accessible to all children. I mean, it's really my life's work. Um, so I started teaching uh, child light, uh, child light yoga. I found a child light yoga first, um, took a bunch of training, started teaching, realized it was what I was supposed to do. I created child light yoga and the child light yoga teacher training program. My kids got into school and I started volunteering in the school. And I realized pretty quickly that what I was doing in the studio and the preschools on the floor and um, after school programs wasn't necessarily working out so well in a classroom, which is where I was often having an opportunity to volunteer. So yoga for classrooms was really developed out of <laughs> basically the challenges that I was encountering. I was coming up against all of these things through that experience of being in the classrooms and trying to share yoga with what I knew was how you share yoga with children. And I, and I found, wait a second, I got to change this up a little bit. First of all, this is a completely different physical setting. Second of all, it's a school environment. You know, this isn't a studio where someone signs up for yoga class. So there's some considerations I need to think about right there. Um, you know, not all of the teachers were necessarily on board. So I was lucky enough to be working with some administrators that were, that's why I was there in the first place. But you know, not all the teachers in, and, and there was even a little bit, not a lot, but there was, you know, a parent or two who were like, what is this thing that, that's going on? I hear, you know, my child is coming home and showing me tree posts. What, what is that? You know, that I don't know if that aligns with my belief system. So out of those challenges and needs, I realized, A, I need buy-in. So how, how do I get that? Well, we got to make sure that we're supporting school goals and that there are some alignments with, you know, the learning and the standards um, that are set up for our children and being in school. Um, there were space constraints. So I had to get really creative and think of ways that we could make this holistic yoga program really classroom friendly. So to be really mindful about what types of activities from my big, huge toolbox that I had were the most classroom friendly. Lack of time, that's the biggest complaint, right? So if you're a teacher or a school counselor, if you work in school at all, you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Um, there are lots and lots of teachers who are really, really overwhelmed. And you know, the idea of bringing in something else to learn and share or to have somebody in to take time, class time away from me, um that it could be a little nerve-wracking so i really had to get creative right about making sure that what we were bringing in were really really simple really accessible really quick little things that we could do to address you know high energy or to address a little bit of anxiety or you know to redirect behavior um the other thing that's really important was safety so making sure that what I was sharing was going to be suitable for all abilities and was also trauma sensitive. And I'm extra sensitive to trauma sensitive for obviously reasons, right? So everything actually that I've ever done in child at yoga and yoga for classrooms has always had, you know, this idea of trauma sensitivity in mind, which has come very natural for me. Um, just because I know how I feel about things. It's, it hasn't always been safe for me to close my eyes. So I'm really sensitive to that. Um, accessibility. So accessibility meaning, meaning enjoyability and also appropriateness. So it's got to be engaging. It's got to be a developmentally appropriate. Um, it needs to address all types of learners, right? So addressing the whole child. And then, of course, school appropriateness. So we're talking about we're in the education system. We're in public education a lot of times. And I've worked in private schools too, but particularly in public schools, there's a set of rules, right? There's a separation of church and state. And even though yoga is not a religion, 
there are some preconceived notions about that. Um, and also, we have everybody at school, so we need to make sure that whatever we're sharing is culturally sensitive. So secularity and making sure that not only is everything completely secular, which it always has been for me because, you know, I'm not a Buddhist, so I, I don't buy into, I don't, I don't practice any religion when I practice yoga. Um, so secularity is really, really important. Not only that, but making sure that everything that we're sharing is comfortable for people, right? That's not going to make shoulders go up um, and hairs bristle on the back of someone's neck, right? So being really cautious and careful about that. Um, parent concerns. So when parents have concerns, we need to um, be ahead of that a little bit, right? So we need to make sure that we're able to address parent concerns mindfully, compassionately. Parents have a right to ask questions. They absolutely do. I'm a parent. I have questions all the time about what's happening in my kid's school. So, you know, I honor that. And I want them to ask questions because that gives me a chance to invite them in, to participate, um, to send home information, to involve them in the process of what we're doing. Um, and hopefully even, you know, have some of what we're learning go home and being practiced at home as well. And then also, and this is really important, sustainability. So sustainability means, you know, is it going to last forever? Can this go on? Um, is it cost effective? That's a good question. Um, What's going to happen if I'm a program provider, right? And I'm and I have this amazing opportunity to share yoga at a school, whether it's in the classrooms or otherwise. And I go and I have this wonderful temporary contract. What happens when I leave? So that was something that was really important to me was to to figure out a way that there was something that I could leave behind, so that maybe there could even be leadership developed from the inside, so that the staff itself was empire, empowered and inspired to keep things going in the school, school-wide, forever. Okay. So we're going to stop here for just a second. And I have a couple of questions for you. And the first one is that... Um, wondering how many of you have actually taken the workshop. So there's a few different ways you could have taken the workshop, yoga and mindfulness in the classroom, tools to improve self-regulation, learning, and classroom climate. You may have taken the workshop out in the public somewhere where, you know, I had a trainer offering it to the public. It could have been maybe through the PESI organization, which is a professional development organization. Um, you may have taken the workshop at your school because it was presented there as an in-service. Um, and you may not have taken the workshop and you may have taken a part of it. So it's possible that you've been at a conference where we've done a one hour introduction or something like that. So my question to you is to go ahead and put yes, you have, no, you have not, or you've maybe had an intro. I'll just give a couple seconds. I took it through PESI, got a couple of no's, a couple of, yep, okay. Oh, online, I forgot about that, right. We have the workshop offered online. Thanks, Jilly. Um, right, so we have an online video-based format for those that are not nearby to something they can take in person. Okay, lots of people saying yes in some way, shape, or form. Has anybody taken an intro? An intro, we do a lot of intros, um, school counseling conferences, um, educator conferences online. Okay, great, thanks for sharing. That gives me a good sense of things. Okay, so for that, those of you who have, those of you who have taken the workshop in some way, shape, or form, I would love to hear from you. This is your Q&A opportunity. Um, how many of you, have some have had some success how many of you are having a lot of challenge um, and if so what are those successes and challenges if you have an antidote anecdote excuse me not an antidote if you have an anecdote um, maybe you'd like to to share that or maybe you have a specific question so think about that put them into the the chat box and I'm going to take a few minutes here to answer a couple of questions or 
would love to, to see how things are going for you and your classrooms. I get a lot of feedback uh, in email, on Facebook. I'm always posting little quotes from people emailing me or messaging me on Facebook. Um, does anybody like to share what's happening in their classrooms? No. This is a live Q&A, people. This is your chance. Okay. I think there is actually a little bit of a delay in what you're putting in the chat box and what I'm actually seeing is what I'm noticing. Okay. Great success in the school. Working as an occupational therapist and with the school with the school psychologist, and you go around to the classrooms introducing yoga and mindfulness. That's amazing. That's so amazing. Okay, we're gonna come back to that later too, because that reminds me of something. Love the cards. Okay, so a challenge. Administrators not comfortable using the word yoga, but prefer to use the word movement. That's great. You know, that's a great alternative. Mindful moments. You call it what you want. Um, is <clears throat> excuse me, getting into more schools, success with doing simple sequence with groups of children presenting at faculty meetings. Oh, yes, that's amazing when you have a chance, and it's great with the kids, but it's also great modeling, and we'll talk about this in a second, when you can get, you know, the five minutes at the beginning of a staff meeting and um, lead, you know, some mindful movements and breathing, using in small groups, especially in the special education classrooms, um, would like to use more in the regular ed. Love using the chime to get the group started. Such a great, um, peaceful, mindful activity. The chime, the chime listening. Um, great feedback. Uh, okay. Challenges, definitely space and moving forward to other schools. So these are questions from program providers. Uh, which is awesome. Uh, my second graders love your cards, love the purple cards. So the purple cards, right, are the imagination vacations, uh, some of the more mindful meditations and the visualizations. Um, and you use them before your day begins. Oh, I bet your day starts off really peacefully. Um, using in your art classes, combining with mindfulness, taking yoga and breathing breaks. That's awesome. Okay. Excellent. Wish yoga would be in all the classrooms, but it's a challenge due to funding. Well, hopefully, Fran, hopefully by the end of this webinar, you're going to have some ideas for that. Um, great success with staff at staff meetings. I, I love this. This has come up a couple of times. No funding for yoga in schools. That's a challenge. Incorporating into individual and small group physical therapy sessions. Would like to get into more of the classrooms. <laughs> yes, art and yoga does sound awesome. All right. So I just wanted to get a good sense of, you know, what your questions were. And I, the reason I'm not answering them right away is because we're going to be answering them pretty naturally um, in the next few slides. And then we'll have a chance to come back around at the very end for a few more questions. So thank you to all of you that are on here and you've been sharing um, so generously. So I'm moving on to the next slide. And what I'd like to talk about next are what I've discovered to be not only really helpful, but ultimately, truly the keys, <laughs> the, the must-haves for successful implementation of a school-wide yoga program. So let's first discuss, de define what school-wide means. So oftentimes, when I'm talking to schools, there'll be a handful of staff members who are integrating yoga and mindfulness in some way, shape, or form. So maybe it's with the special ed classes, maybe the school counselor is doing some things and integrating into classroom guidance, um, et cetera, and so forth. Maybe there's an after-school program. Um, maybe oh, I don't know, maybe there's a mindful moment on the announcements at the beginning of the day. So there's always a clear with little things, but it's not necessarily an organized, consistent initiative that's happening all across the school. Um, so when I say school-wide yoga program or school-wide yoga and mindfulness program or school-wide 
initiative, any kind of initiative. Um, I'm talking about something where just like a math program, right, a new math program or a new reading program, you know, it's implemented school-wide. So that's what I'm talking about when I say school-wide. So four keys to successful implementation. By the way, this isn't just for yoga and mindfulness. This would be really, I think, anything new that we were trying to integrate school-wide. Um, we absolutely, of course, number one, is we absolutely have to have administration buy-in, first and foremost, and, and from that, right, trickles down staff buy-in and support for integration into the daily schedule. And I want to stop there and just say that not only are these my thoughts and my experiences on what I have found to be the keys, but this is also what um, one of my school's principals, Edmonds Elementary in Des Moines, Iowa, this is what she really defined and, and said the same thing. So you can read about her and the, and the Edmonds School um, it's the most latest blog post that we have, and there's a video, it's actually a kind of a video case study of their experience with having implemented Yoga for Classrooms school-wide for the last two years. And it's pretty impressive, um, the impact and the results of that. And she shares, uh, actually in the article part of that, about what she really thought were the keys to their success and you know this is the a number one thing that she said you know the fact that i'm on board and i made this a priority um is is a lot of why it's been successful um so administration and staff so you know a lot of us work in schools um, maybe we're a staff member at a school maybe we're going into schools and you'll have the naysayers right the naysayers, those are the ones who are too overwhelmed, I don't have enough time, um, there's no time for this, um, you know, and so forth. So we, how do we get those people back on board? Um, we also need effective and thorough training materials and resources. So you've got to have, these are, again, you can read in, Janet Rittman is the name of the principal. You can read in her article, she basically says the same thing. That you got to have really good training. you got to have really good materials and a foundation and a, and a, a groundwork to start with. Um, and then number three, internal leadership and teaming for rollout. It's really important that someone doesn't try to do this all by themselves, right? And it's also really important that the leadership and motivation and creativity that's going into the hows and whys is coming really from the from the inside. So for those of us who are program providers, right, we can go into a school and we can present, um, we can teach the kids, we can teach the teachers, we can, we can hand over curriculum, but if there's not a group of people, ideally a group of people, on the inside that are taking that on and making it their own and taking ownership of it, it's, it makes it a lot more challenging to become a school-wide initiative. So internal leadership and teaming for rollout. Um, and then finally, once you've got everything in place, right, it's ongoing reflection and refinement. And that, of course, comes from the data, the experiences, and the input from all the key stakeholders. So it never really ends. And by the way, it says here at the bottom, one size does not fit all. So what school-wide implementation looks like in one school might look and should look, actually, very different than what it looks like in a completely different school with a different set of community members, demographics, and school goals, um, and other initiatives that we already have going on. So, you know, any yoga and mindfulness program should be in support of all of those things, right? And so what it looks like is going to depend on how we can best support the rest of what's going on at that school, like whether it's the, the community, um, the particular stressors and challenges that they have, whether it's behavior, et cetera, and so forth. Um, there's just so much to consider. So one size does not fit all, and that's really important to understand. I know I kind of plunked it right down there at the bottom of the slide, but I just didn't want to forget uh, to mention that. So here's some things that we can do right this very second 
to encourage, buy, and support. And I actually saw in the chat earlier that some of you are already doing some of this already. Um, the first number one thing, and I know 25% of you don't have this right now, so I'm, I'm going to bring it up. It's really important that we develop and maintain our own personal practice so that you know, we're laying the foundation. It's supporting our own resilience, and it's also allowing us to model mindfulness and being mindful, mindful teaching and learning, which is the best form of teaching and learning. Um, it also can help us provide a space of non-judgment and non-attachment um, in ourselves, and from that place we can share without need for other people to buy in necessarily to what we're doing. So it's important that we have our own personal practice. Um, next, it, we need to obtain foundational training and resources. I mean, that's that's pretty obvious. You can't start from scratch. So, you know, whether it's picking up the card deck or, you know, getting some training, it's really important that we, that we have that. Um, if you're working in a school, you know, it's helpful to take a training that's, you know, if you're a classroom teacher specific to the classroom, that could be really helpful. Um, if you're a PE teacher, physical educator, and I think we maybe had one or two of those, um, you know, you might, you might look into a, a children's yoga teacher training that's a little bit broader than the classroom, right? Because you, you have a gym to work with. And, and whether or not you have yoga mats, you have space, which is different than what we've got in the classroom. We want to share with our students. So jump right in and not be afraid to just take whatever resources we have right now and start sharing now. And then model, model, model. So some of you even said that you were sharing um, in staff meetings and things like that. That's all part of modeling you know this is how we start our time together we take a moment to arrive to center take a mindful breath to take a pause right so that now we can go into our meeting we can go into our math lesson we can go into our conversation grounded ready to really truly listen and be heard that's just modeling. We can do that in the classroom. We can do that in the staff meeting. We can do that in the hallway. We can do that in our parent-teacher conferences. And this is why you see why it's so important to have a personal practice. We can also invite observation. So if you've got something really cool going on in your classroom, right, and you're seeing some awesome results, and you can see that your kids are really responding, and it's really benefiting them, and creating a more positive, peaceful you know, classroom setting, an environment for you for learning, for you and the rest of your students, then why not invite another colleague in? Invite your school principal in. Invite the parent-teacher organization president in. Um, invite people. Invite people to come and feel and see what it is that you're doing and invite them to participate with you too. Um, collect data and monitor impact. So, you know, that could be as easy as You've got one particular student, right, that you're concerned about. You start practicing these things. You see what resonates. And you start, you know, just kind of jotting down, you know, what's happening with this student. What might be helping? What might not be? What does he really like? Um, what resonates with him? That's, you know, that doesn't have to be some crazy thing that you do for collecting data. Now, if you want to go deeper, um, you can certainly do that. Uh, School-wide, you know, we're looking at, you could do this classroom-wide too, looking at office referrals, right? Looking at grades, looking at um, your perception and the, and the student's perception of classroom climate, school climate. Um, you know, there is there are surveys out there. Uh, the Gallup poll, for example, I know has has like a teacher engagement, a student engagement survey. You know, there could be some things that your school is already using um, where it wouldn't be that hard for you to be noticing what's happening and the impact of what you're sharing in the school based on what that what data they're already collecting. Um, it's important to identify a partner. So if you're in a school, you want to find someone who's on the same page with you to be a partner in crime, right? A partner in really good crime, the good kind of crime in all of this, and ideally even develop a team. So if you're really thinking about school-wide implementation, like I said before, it's it's tricky to do it by yourself. I mean, you really need it's it's accountability, it's all kinds of things. Like when you have someone, it's it's inspiring and empowering to have a regular meeting time to get together with this other person or a team and uh, brainstorm, you know, ways that you can share with the rest of the school. 
Um, also, develop and present a clear and compelling proposal. So I know some of you were asking a few minutes ago, one of the questions was, you know, things are going really well, but I, you know, I want to, I want to bring this school wide and I don't know how to do that, right? So make sure that you're really organized when it does come time to sit down with the school principal, when it does come down to time to go into that staff meeting and give a presentation on some thoughts and ideas you have for sharing and bringing this forth in a bigger way out of your classroom or out of your school counseling office. Um, make sure that you have a really compelling proposal. And um, the proposal should include, you know, things like the neuroscience of stress and trauma for students and teachers, by the way, and the impact on learning and behavior that that has, the scientific evidence for school-based yoga and mindfulness practices. Um, case studies, you want to address how the integration of mind-body practices supports school goals. We talked about that before, whether that's school climate goals, academic achievement goals, social emotional learning, you know, movement and wellness, teacher resilience, behavior goals. Um, and then, of course, you want to outline steps for the team-led school-wide implementation. And you want to outline it in a way that's, that's really accessible. So in terms of format and the content of what you'd like to do and the cost, you want to make sure that what you're presenting is going to be effective and also sustainable, right? We've talked about that. Okay. So we're going to move on from here and talk about um, the implement program. So you might not know about this. So there is a next level of the Yoga for Classrooms training, and it's called Yoga for Classrooms Implement Leader Training. Implement The Implement Leader Training was really developed because I had so many teachers saying, what's next? You know, I'm doing all this great stuff in my classroom, and I, I want to share it in a bigger way across my whole school. You know, how do I do that? So I put Implement together to inspire and empower schools to do that, to effectively, affordably, and sustainably be able to integrate yoga and mindfulness school-wide by providing training, resources, encouragement, and support so that you can do that by yourself from the inside. Model schools have successfully integrated Y4C into their daily structures, and they've done that by attending training and then in partnership with me, developing a customized, very specific to that school, right? Very specific, and a, a customized phased action plan um, with my support. And then the other thing that we really focus on with Implement is teaming. So how many of you have, te like, teaming? Is that a word in your school? I know some schools use it, and some schools call it different things, but it's this idea of working in teams. Sometimes they're grade-level teams, right, that you get together with your grade-level um, teachers and you work on different things. Um, in general, the teaming approach is something I am a huge fan of. And so we really encourage that with the Implement program. It encourages a collaborative, intrinsically motivated, sustainable intervention. When you have a team, right, versus an individual, it's just way more powerful for obvious reasons. Um, and the other neat thing about Implement, and I guess the intention of it too, and I mentioned this earlier, is that it, affordability, right? Schools don't have any money, so there, there's no funding. Several of you mentioned that before. So the beautiful thing about this model of empowering, inspiring schools from the inside is that ultimately the costs, ongoing costs, are minimized as implementation becomes an internal endeavor. Maybe not eliminating dependence, because I'm a I'm a big supporter. Like if you have a yoga program provider in your neighborhood, in your community, that that person should be in your school if there is any opportunity for for that to be happening, um, because that is only going to support anything that you're doing on the inside. So, but ultimately, you know, reducing or potentially even eliminating dependence on an external program provider. Um, but again. You know what my real vision is, is that every single school has, you know, a director of yoga and mindfulness, but, you know, that will happen. It's already happening at some schools. There is, you know, a, um, a yoga teacher, you know, on staff, or there is a, a director of social emotional learning in the district. And like, those are really big steps in the right direction. Okay. 
So this is what some of the, our implement leaders are saying. Um, you know, they come to our training. Our training, it's a hybrid training, actually. So we got all kinds of learners out there. And what I've really come to realize, it used to be this kind of this long training, um, about three and a half days. And I ended up reducing it to really just over two days because usually a typical weekend. And I did that because it worked really well when I had to do it when I recently went out to Des Moines and trained six school teams there from the Des Moines district. What I realized was it was really helpful for people to do some of the self-study work and the, and the pre-work before they got to the training and then we were able to dive more deeply and fully into the, the um, and have more time for the action planning piece, which was really, really important and huge for them. So um, it is a hybrid format. There's about six to eight hours of, of home study work that is uh, video based primarily. And then, and then we get together in person and we do the rest of it. So these just a little bit of feedback. I won't literally read all of these, but um, you can see here the feedback's been really positive. You know, um, I feel so well prepared to lead implementation at my school. We were provided a phenomenal wealth of information to utilize as needed. Um, I loved being able to connect with other teachers from around the country. Um, we have other schools chime in live during our training and share their stories with you so that you can learn from what they've done as you start developing your own action plans. Really, really cool, very powerful. Um, the best part was being taught the material from Lisa. Oh, that was very nice. Um, it has been and continues to be a fantastic teacher-driven district initiative. This is the district that I work with. Um, yeah, so, and then this top one, of course, is from JNET. We've been implementing school-wide for two years. Office referrals are down, test scores are up. It's an incredibly well-organized program which empowers educators to meet the needs of all types of learners while supporting school goals. And there's a couple of other um, quotes here as well. So it just gives you a, just a general sense of what you'd be walking away with and what the impact would be, um, hopefully, as you go back to your school and share with the rest of your school community. So I have some really cool resources, really helpful resources. So we just had this big conversation and I mentioned all these little things that would be helpful for you to know, um, that would be helpful for you to have, and I'm gonna give them to you. So it's gonna be kind of a long email <laughs> that you're gonna get into your inbox because I don't have everything listed here, um, but I'm gonna send you links to a couple helpful webinars. Um, oh, this recording is one of them. Um, some printable blog and published articles that'll really uh, support you in bringing this forth and making a case for uh, not only school-wide implementation, but really like yoga in schools in general. Video case studies, I'm gonna send you some links to some of those. Um, obviously, I'll give you a link to the research repository so you have that as a direct link so that you can go and download that at your earliest convenience. Um, on that same page, actually, on our supporting research page is a really nice summary of the research with citations and just kind of some of the benefits of yoga in schools with citations right next to it. So that's that's a really fun page to really just print out and bring with you. There's also a really good article summary as well from our blog. So I'll give you a link to that. Um, I also have some book recommendations. Um, I'll tell you what a couple of them are right now because it's pretty exciting. Um, the best practices for yoga in schools one is obviously one. But as well, my good friend Louise Bro Goldberg's book just is coming out. You can pre-order it on Amazon and it's called Classroom Yoga Breaks. And uh, I am an endorser. So honored to have her ask me to endorse her book, which I mean, I, I didn't even know where to start when I got it um, to read the manuscript. But anyway, my, my endorsement is on the back, the back cover, which is pretty cool. Um, and, and, and I would do it 100 times again. So it's going to be one of my most highly recommended resources for just about anybody who not only works in schools or works with kids, uh, excuse me, works with schools, works in schools, but who has a child in general or works with kids in any way, shape, or form. It's just some really, really awesome uh, information in there. Not only making the case for yoga in schools, but just tons, a plethora of um, really nice, well thought out uh, activities with the evidence even uh, outlined to support them. Um, and then finally, I'm going to give you It'll be pretty simple, but it might it might help you out at this point. I'm going to give you what I'm what I just decided earlier today. I was going to call the implement three step action planning worksheet. So the action planning worksheet will have 
you know, a few things to get you started. Just some things to think about, like your goals, um, what supports and challenges you might be encountering, and um, you know, just a way to to put some action steps together for the next steps you might take here in this process. Um, so I'll include an example or two, and with that too, just so you know and supports and challenges. So hopefully those will be really helpful help, helpful to you. I'm going to send that email out probably tomorrow. I just need to finish it up because I keep I keep adding things. So like I said, it, it might be a little lengthy, but you'll want to check your inbox for that. Um, and then finally, I promised you there would be some amazing bonuses. So I'm going to share with those with you right now. And don't worry about writing all this down because you're going to get the email, right? And I will have the same exact information um, well, not exact, but I'll have the same information in the email. So the first bonus, which is actually already going on right now, so it just might not be something that you know about, is if you have, are you one of those people who hasn't taken the workshop, then you might have interest in doing that, right, sooner than later. So certainly you could, you could um, look and see what is being offered nearby to you and go and take a workshop in person. Um, and if you're not able to do that, you might want to take it online or you might want to bring the workshop to your school as an in-service. But right now we have a really big sale, like $31 off the online course. So if that is something that interests you, the feedback on our online course. So it's funny because it was videotaped. Um, I don't even know how many years ago it was a little bit ago. Um, but it's still when, when people do the quiz and evaluation uh, for, to get their certificate at the end of that, it, it gets tens out of tens. I, I'm just floored still. Cause to me, it feels like for me watching it, I'm like, Oh, it's, I'm old. I'm so much younger in that. It seems really old, but the content is still really, really relevant. And it's not that much different from what we share now. Um, so if you want to take advantage of that, this is a good time to do it because that back to school sale ends on October 31st. And that is something that you can share with anybody. So if you want to share that around to your colleagues and community, um, that is something that I encourage you to do. And then the second bonus, this is really huge. I've never done this before ever, but I love working with schools. I love it. I love it. And what I have found is when I or my trainers can get into a school and we can do a staff wide full day interactive, inspiring yoga for classroom, yoga for classrooms, you know, yoga and mindfulness tools for the classroom workshop, it sets the stage and the foundation for anything else that that school wants to do. Because what happens through that workshop experience is everybody gets their buy in. That's already done and accomplished, right? By the end of that workshop, everyone's like, oh my gosh, we we need to do like we need to do this right now, right? And from that develops naturally a leadership team. There will be those, you know, five, six, eight, ten people from that workshop who sift to the surface. And I always tell this to the school principal or whoever's organizing, you watch, you're gonna have a team before you know it. And it happens every time. And the in-service workshop is such a great way to get things going in your school in a bigger way. So if you're a classroom teacher, school counselor, and you're doing a little bit here and there, and you wanna make a big impact quickly, take advantage of this offer, $200 off. It's kind of crazy, it's a lot, um, but, you know, again, one of my biggest things is to make things as accessible as possible. The more accessible the trainings can be, the content, the resources, the more accessible I can make all of this while still earning a living, the more accessible I can make it all, the more children are going to be reached, the more in, of a positive impact is going to be happening in our schools and for our teachers. So this is what I'm doing. So the only thing is you have to have, we don't have to hold the workshop in the next 60 days. You've got plenty of time for that, but you have to, we have to have a contract in the next 60 days. So this is something you'll want to bring to your school administrator and say, Hey, there's this amazing opportunity. Um, but we need to look into it pretty soon because in order to get this discount, we need to have a contract in place with yoga for classrooms in the next 60 days. So you can take a look at the information. It's the same workshop that we present publicly. It's just that it, we change it up a little bit um, because you know each other when we're doing it in service, which is fun. Um, and the only, the way that you would do this is you just go to our contact 
page, fill in the information, and then the comments field say, hey, I watched the webinar. I want to hold an in-service and get $200 off. But just let me know. And that's how you get started with that. So it's super exciting. Okay. Um, bonus number three, save $75 on the Implement Leader Training Registration. So we've been talking a lot about the Implement Leader Training, and this is huge. So it's, it's actually valid for as many team members as you have. So if you have eight team members at your school, eight team members can get this discount. Um, it's important to note, though, that you first, and you will see this on the, on the description page, you must first have completed the one-day workshop, right? That's the prerequisite, and you need to have some experience using the tools and activities with your students first. You gotta have a little experience with that. We say three months experience on the website. There's a little wiggle room for that. If you've been really, really consistent, you could do in less. Um, this is valid for as many team members as you have. It's You just have to register them individually. So there's a different link for individual versus team registration. No matter how many team members you have, you register individually. And then, um, so there's your bonus code. And I will be sending that to you via email. So don't worry about writing all that down right now. And this would be on new registrations only, unfortunately. So if you're already registered for Implement, um, unfortunately, this isn't for you. But maybe you could grab another team member and bring them along. So this is a significant savings. I don't know the percentage, but it's it's a pretty good one. If you take a look at the description, you'll see that. Um, so before we finish up, it is exactly 10 o'clock. I can't even believe that we're on time. Um, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I know that so many of you, it's getting kind of late, but if you have any final questions, now is the time to ask them. So go ahead and put any final questions into the chat box. I'm glad that you enjoyed the webinar. Looks like some people are logging off. I'm gonna give it a couple seconds because I know that I have a delay. All right. So I want to just thank everyone so, so much for joining me tonight. I know it's pretty late. Um, you juggle a lot and you're probably exhausted at the end of the day. Um, so I thank you so much for taking the time to join me. I hope that you found the webinar helpful to you. And again, look out for the email and hopefully you'll find those links and resources really helpful. And as well, hopefully you'll have a chance to take uh, opportunities advantage of some or even all of the bonus offers so thank you thank you so much everybody thank you rachel esther have a great night take care